Hello, uh, my name is Patrick Savage, um, and I'm very proud to be here today to report the results of my KGRI startup grant for the 2019 financial year. Uh, my project is entitled A Global Network for Experimental Music Cognition. Now, uh, it's a very strange time right now, the coronavirus. Uh, you may be wondering, you know, why should we care about music? Shouldn't we be focusing all our energies, our time and money on, you know, medicine, fighting this disease? But um, I think actually this, the pandemic is showing us that it's so much more than just about um, medicine, disease, it's about society, it's about the economy, it's about personal connections, art and love. Um, so you may have seen in the news people in Italy and Spain who've been locked down, they can't go outside through coronavirus, but they're connected with each other through music. They're going onto their balconies, uh, singing songs, playing instruments, and it's, it's something that's really keeping us together in this very tough time. That's in Italy, but the same thing is happening in Spain, here, and it's happening in the Middle East, it's happening in China. So I actually think that now it's, it's just as important as ever to understand what about music is so universal and powerful, and how can we use it to bring us together in this really challenging time. So, I hope that what the work I've done this past year has helped towards that goal, and I hope that going forward, I can continue this to, to, to work towards that goal. Um, so just an overview of my report. So I'm going to be describing um, the main outputs that I've done from the past nine months, uh, which include getting about uh, a Mayan worth of funding from the Japanese government and applying to a number of other grants. Uh, I've done 17 conference pre presentations, myself and my students around the world. Uh, submitted or published uh, or about to submit seven peer-reviewed articles um, and we also organized this really what was going to be a very fantastic symposium in New York City. Um, it was supposed to be happening just as we speak. I was supposed to be in New York City but of course with coronavirus it had to be postponed until next year. Um, so I really hope that I can um, continue this project next year and make that a success. Uh, just to give you some background um, about why we're doing this project. Um, so in addition to obviously music being very important and universal. Um, it's part of this big movement towards the digital humanities um, and sort of a global interdisciplinary science of the world's music. Uh, and this is something very, I think, special and important for KO. Um, so we all know that, that humanities is one of KO's strong points and has been since its very beginning. Um, so Yukichi. Um, but in the last 10 or, or 15 years, there's been a real decline throughout the world in the humanities. And unfortunately, there's probably going to be more of that, um, you know, with the current economic downturn and the coronavirus. Uh, however, one bright spot has been the digital humanities has really been taking off in the last few decades. Um, there's been a lot of high-profile uh, scientific papers published in top journals such as Science, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Nature, uh, and I've been proud to be an author on some of these papers. Um, and so this is really a bright spot in the humanities and I think a really strategic strength for KO. Um, and KO is very strong in, in big data, including my, my campus and SFC, um, a lot of big data analyses, computer science. Um, but we really need to bridge the humanities and the arts with the sciences and the computer science. And that's what I hope to do. Uh, in particular, my focus is on the world's music and its science, um, where I have my expertise. Um, and again, there's been a lot of kind of progress in this area. Um, for myself and my colleagues um, throughout the world, uh, places like MIT, Harvard, Columbia, Max Planck, um, but now also at KO. We're, really, we're establishing a really strong team here at KO with myself, with uh, Shinya Fuji, Naoto Ki, um, people who specialize in the science of music. Uh, and for this particular grant, um, the KGRI Startup Grant, I've also teamed up with um, two leading scholars in this field. Um, and so here's us having a little strategic meeting at a conference, uh, at a workshop we organized in Germany, Max Planck. So there's myself, there's Nora Jacobi, uh, who's a research group leader at Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics. And then Lisa Margulis, who's a professor at Princeton University and the president of the Society for Music Perception and Cognition. And so the three of us uh, applied for this KGR grant. And we also, along with, um, with Professor Fuji and Professor, professor Tokui, 
uh, and Professor Ajimi from Tokyo University, University of the Arts have applied and successfully received the grant from uh, the Japanese government. So this is kind of the background and the core team that we have going forward. Uh, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the progress that we made, the outputs that we produced in the last nine months. So um, the main goal of this startup is to um, get projects going so that uh, they can receive external funding and become self-sufficient. And I'm proud to say that we've uh, obtained one major grant from the Japanese government, Kakenhi. Uh, this is a Kokusai Kyodo Kenkyu Kasoku Kikin grant designed to, for exactly this type of international collaboration. Uh, as I said, this is done with uh, Lisa Margulis at Princeton, Nori Jacobi at Max Planck, and then uh, Professor Fuji Tokui at Keio, and Professor Ajimi at uh, Tokyo University of the Arts. And this is for uh, a six-year period. Um, and the project is very similar to um, the title of this, this presentation, which is Understanding Global Diversity in Music Perception and Production. Um, so we really want to understand not just what's special about music in you know, America or music in Japan, but what is it about music uh, around the world that's so universal but also so unique, and how do people's perceptions of music uh, and production of music differ, and what does that mean for, for us and our, for our society? Um, and so uh, I'd like to move on to some of the uh, specific research outputs from these, these grants. Um, so the big question here is, you know, why do humans make music? Uh, and this is something that people have been wondering since Darwin and beyond. So Darwin wrote, uh, as neither the enjoyment nor the capacity of producing musical notes are faculties of the least use to man in reference to his daily habits of life, they must be ranked among the most mysterious with, with which he is endowed. They're present in men of all races, but so different is the taste of the several races, races that our music gives no pleasure to savages, and their music is to us, in most cases, hideous and unmeaning. Now, uh, you know, his language is, is not very politically correct for today, but the idea is very important. So it seems like music would be a waste of our time and money. And it seems like there should be other things more important, food, um, you know, housing, medicine. But as we saw, this is something that's very fundamental and, and, and important to people. So why do we spend so much time and money and effort on it? And there are a number of theories. Um, some people say maybe it's not about survival, but it's about uh, sexual selection, finding a mate, advertising yourself to, um, to, to a partner. Other people say it's about connecting with your um, parents and children. So here's me singing to my, my son when he's born. Uh, and others say it's about bringing groups together, bonding groups together, like um, in, in times of trouble. Uh, and so the article that uh, I'm working on and has been submitted and we got positive reviews back and it's now under revision um, for resubmission and we are feeling very uh, hopeful about acceptance at this journal. Uh, and we argue that these are not really competing but they're all sort of one different facet of the same idea, which is social bonding. So music brings us together. Um, and so this is kind of the framework for which we're trying to understand music throughout the world. Um, and one of the main ways we try to do this is through cross-cultural experimental studies. Um, now, there's a lot of issues and challenges involved with these kinds of studies. Um, and they're, they've been done for many, a long time, and people have had problems with the way they're done, ethical issues with you know, scientists from the West going out into non-Western countries, studying them using um, kind of poor frameworks or exploiting them, um, not using good scientific methods to compare among them. So we convened um, a group of 20 experts from around the world, you know, leading places like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Max Planck. Uh, I was the only representative from, from Asia, actually, um, but from all over kind of uh, America and Europe. And we, we got all these experts from very different fields that come together and agree on some of the key issues here, including things like ethics, empirical methods, and how do we actually define music and culture. Um, and so this is a really important starting point to frame all the experimental work that we're going to be doing going forward. Um, so those, and this was just published uh, about a month ago, um, and expecting many more good things from this. Uh, so then some of the more specific empirical studies that we were doing. So in addition to actual experiments, we're also doing um, audio recording database analysis. So for example, we're doing cross-species analysis. We got a sample of about 100 recordings of human music, bird songs, and speech from around the world. And we analyze the similarities and differences. We find, interestingly, that um, this idea that's been around since Pythagoras, that there's something special about music that has these harmonic, you know, pleasant, harmonious intervals. In particular, these simple integer ratios, so three to two, perfect fifth, or four to three, perfect fourth, that are found in music, but not in speech or birdsong. 
Um, there's something about this, this, uh, uh, this ratio that kind of makes us uh, harmonize, both literally and, and figuratively. So um, we do that kind of database study, but the, the core of this study is more about kind of uh, experiments. And uh, the main experiment that's got this going that we're almost ready to submit uh, is looking at rhythm. So this was inspired by some uh, work that Nori Jacobi did a, f uh, a few years back, but then we want to test it around the world. And so we've collected data from hundreds um, of uh, participants, actually thousands of participants from around the world. Um, and there's these interesting similarities and differences, but there's these, again, these simple integer ratios keep coming across. And this is rhythmic ratios. So for some reason, certain kinds of simple, simple ratios such as one, one, two, one, one, two, um, these are universal. And it seems to be connected to the way that people want to, um, to synchronize together and and either sing in, in harmony or in rhythm and synchrony, or dance or make music together. So it's a, again, it seems to be supporting the social bonding idea. And so using this network, um, we're about to submit these papers, uh, these results to Nature in just a few months once we finish off the manuscript. Um, but using the same network of researchers and uh, facilities around the world, we're going to do a number of other studies. And we've already started doing these studies, um, kind of piloting them in Japan. We have uh, articles just ready to submit next month. Um, the deadline is April 1st and April 10th for these articles. Uh, one of them is already submitted and is uh, currently under review. And so these are not just rhythm, but they're domains like cooperation. So we find that actually when people um, uh, synchronize to a, to, a, to a rhythm, when they s uh, recite text to a rhythm as opposed to without, without a synchronized rhythm, they're more generous. They actually give more yen to each other in a public good economic game than they do if they do this without a beat. Um, we also look at creativity and copyright, uh, and this is actually a sort of a surprising finding. So studies from Western copyright law um, suggest that melody um, is the kind of the most important way that people judge copyright cases. And this has a lot of implications for high profile copyright cases, um, you know, millions of dollars. But uh, we actually found uh, with our data that it was sort of the opposite. Um, so it wasn't just melody, but it was all the features in the full audio. So um, timbre, so the way that the voice sounds, instrumentation, these all play a role in the way that people judge copyright. So this is sort of a surprising thing that's uh, where Japan is not seeming to have the same tendencies as we find in the US. Um, and so this will be really um, interesting to look at as we expand this study through, throughout the world going forward. And finally, aesthetics. So what do people find more pleasing or less pleasing? Um, and again, we've collected results from, from Japan. So these are all sort of um, not exactly pilot experiments, but um, we're perfecting the paradigm within the Japanese context. And once it's been perfected and published and validated, then we extend this throughout the world. And we've, done, uh, pr we've tested 114 participants here. Um, and we find with aesthetics, as you predict, um, there's more variability in aesthetic features. So for example, things like grooviness or pleasantness um, we find there's more diversity within participants, whereas they're much easier to agree on things like um, rhythmic structure or pitch range. So there's sort of a, um, a consistent, uh, consistent with predictions that um, aesthetics vary more cross-culturally than stylistic features. But again, this is something that we need to test on a, on a global scale going forward. So those are our empirical results. Um, and then finally, what I was really excited uh, to tell you about uh, if it hadn't been for the coronavirus, was this conference that we organized. Um, so myself, Nori Jacobi, and Elizabeth Margulis um, organized this workshop in New York City at the Max Planck uh, and New York University uh, Center for Language, Music, and Emotion. We invited 20 scholars from all around the world, so uh, including places like Nigeria and South Africa, New Zealand, uh, as well as UK, USA, Spain, um, Portugal, things like that, and really top experts in the world, you know, president of the Society for Music Perception and Cognition, president of the International Council for Traditional Music, representatives from the UN. It was going to be great, but we had to postpone it, unfortunately. Um, but I'm pleased to say that we um, have successfully um, secured the same venue for February in 2021, and 17 of the participants have said they should be able to attend. Um, so what I'm really hoping is that if I can continue this grant uh, going forward into the 2020 year, um, then we can use that funding to actually hold this conference as planned uh, and this will again result in, I think, a very important high-profile publications and, um, and also a real Im impact on um, the, both not just the academic world, but also industry and musicians themselves. So 
in conclusion, um, I hope that I've showed you that I've made some really strong progress in just the nine months since I've received the KGR startup funding uh, in terms of you know, securing uh, a substantial external grant, producing a number of uh, articles either published or about to be submitted for peer review, and conference presentations. But we do need some additional funding to make this conference happen that was postponed due to coronavirus. So I hope that um, we can work together to make that happen. Thank you for attention, uh, and thank you for all your support throughout the past nine months. Yoshiko, Anayashimasu.